Hello again. How's everyone doing? Uh, I'm going to give us probably like a minute or two to kind of get set up. I know Heimler is finishing up his review video as we speak. And so um, I'm going to just kind of get set up and do a little bit of intro stuff and Hello hopefully again. everyone will be able to join How's us. How's everyone doing? Oh no, I hadn't muted my other screen yet. All right. Um, so welcome to the last of our content cram sessions. So again, if you're new, uh, I'm Emily Glankler. I'm a his AP history teacher in Austin, Texas. And I also have a podcast and like a website called Anti-Social Studies. So I've been doing these cram sessions for the last few days. Um, and you can find the older videos, they're posted on YouTube. This video will be posted on YouTube right after we're done. So if you wanna go back and watch it later or share it with friends, you can do that. Um, so welcome y'all, uh, please use the chat. Uh, I will do my best to answer questions in the chat, especially if they're related to content, but as it gets probably more crowded, it might be a little bit hard. So um, I just wanted to let you know that the PowerPoint that I'm gonna go through today will be, is, will be or is already posted on my website, um, which is antisocialstudies.org. And um, the, again, the link to this video will be up there as well. So um, you can take notes today, you can not take notes, uh, you, can, you can do whatever you want. So while we're waiting for everyone to kind of filter in, I'm curious to the, you know, the few people that are here right now, um, hey y'all, hey Akshay, hey Anna, um, hey Amal. Uh, if y'all have any specific questions uh, kind of before I launch into my crazy content uh, cram session, again, today we're focusing on 1750 to 1900. Um, so if you do throw them in the chat. Also, I wanna let you know that tomorrow at this time at three, I am going to be doing like an AMA. So basically I posted on my Instagram stories where you can submit questions to me about anything related to the WAP exam content, but honestly, mostly probably like rubric stuff, um, essays, timing, that sort of thing. So make sure you go onto my Instagram account and find my story where you can send me questions. And then I'm gonna basically answer as many of those as I can in an hour tomorrow from three to four. So um, let's see, a few people are already asking like, what do you need to know about enlightenment and scientific revolution? Um, Renaissance Protestant Reformation, here's the trick. Uh, they cut out a lot of that stuff from, from the content this year. It's basically, most of that is useful as context at this point. So the Renaissance itself is not a thing we actually really taught explicitly, at least in my class, but the Renaissance could be helpful as context for like changing culture. In general, Renaissance, Enlightenment, Scientific Revolution, Protestant Reformation are all just a sign of growing secularism in Europe, meaning people are moving away from doing just exactly what the church says and not questioning anything else. And they're starting to think more about their human experience. So we first see, th see that through art in the Renaissance um, with instead of painting baby Jesus, we paint the Mona Lisa. And then we start to also observe the natural world around us and come to some conclusions about science and government. So really those events in European history, that's more AP Euro stuff. Um, for our purposes in WAP, that could be helpful as context, like talking about what other things are happening at the time, but it's not really a main focus anymore. Okay, so uh, welcome y'all. Welcome everyone who's showing up. Um, again, this is gonna be posted on my YouTube. So the recording will be posted and the PowerPoint that I'm about to share with y'all I'll go ahead and do that now, will also be posted on um, my website, antisocialstudies.org. And so um, what I wanna do, there we go, is I wanna go ahead and start um, talking about 1750 to 1900 because there's a lot going on. Um, this is, I mean, it's really still just two time periods, but honestly, when I was teaching this, I broke it up into three or four. There was so much to cover. And so um, again, today the focus is entirely on content. So I'm not really gonna be able to talk much about the points of the rubric. If you have points of the rubric about outside evidence or describing and using, I have made tons of videos about that. So um, today is just about content, but on my uh, YouTube channel, you can see a ton of videos where I've done one about how to use the documents instead of just addressing them. Um, I've done one about the difference between context and outside evidence with examples. I've done one on HIP or evaluating the document. I have a whole one on DBQ strategy. So again, if you have questions about like, the mechanics of writing an essay, um, go check out those videos. And again, come back tomorrow at the same time I'm doing an AMA, like an Ask Me Anything, where people are sending me questions through my Instagram, uh, especially the Instagram story I just posted. And then I will address as many of those as I possibly can in an hour tomorrow. So 
for the uh, for today. Oh, and also a few people are asking about resources and stuff. Yeah, you can use any resources that you have while you're taking the test. They've already said it's an open note test. You just can't collaborate with anyone else. So if you find these PowerPoints helpful and you're taking notes, you can use those notes. You could go download these PowerPoints and have them on your computer while you're taking the test. Um, anything that is helpful to you. But of course, the AP exam is not so much about you having memorized content. It's about you using it and like making arguments with it. So that's how I format these cram sessions for me is I kind of give you like a topic sentence and then I give you supporting evidence. So I try to uh, mimic what you want to be doing in the DBQ. Okay, so welcome and let's just hop in. Um, and yeah, a few people were asking, I think that this is the most likely unit for there to be a DBQ. There's just the most to talk about. Um, I think 1450 on is, is the stuff I would be focusing most of my time on, although you do need to study that first period, 1200 to 1450, just in case. I, I think probably one DBQ will come from 1200 to 1450, but I think most of them will come from these later time periods. I love the 19th century. The 19th century is like the most, one of the most interesting hundred years in all of world history. And there's a lot of DBQs that could come from that. Okay, so here's the big picture, right? And I'm not gonna like pause too hard on this because you can go find this later. But basically what's happening in the West is that the West has risen, Europe has risen, and now those traditional power structures are being challenged. So that's gonna be political revolutions. That's gonna be these enlightenment ideals that we were just talking about. Um, and so some are gonna change radically and some are not gonna change much at all. Western nations are also industrializing during this time period. And so we're going to develop a lot of philosophies in reaction to this changing economy. Um, we're going to see kind of social philosophies like socialism and communism. Um, and we're also going to see non-Western nations trying to keep up and figure out how much of this modernization do they want to accept and adopt. Um, and then mostly Western nations are going to build these massive sea-based empires, right? So 1450 to 1750 is like post empires, right, in these port cities and kind of American colonies. But 1700 is like they're going in to the big guys, Africa and Asia, and they are taking over that land directly, right? So this time period is often called the age of imperialism. Um, they are going to use these conquests and these empires to feed industrialization, and they're going to basically change the entire global economy in the span of about 150 years. And obviously, this, that's going to be resisted as well. Okay. Um, a lot of people are asking about the logistics of like what you can use on the test. And I just want to make sure we're really clear, even though I'm mostly going over content today. Yeah, there's no lockdown browser on the test, but they're monitoring like collaborative websites and they're kind of monitoring that activity. So you want to be really careful. Like if you are going to use a Google Doc, just make sure it's not shared with anyone else. Because if, if your notes are on a Google Doc, but you shared them with your friend and you go there and your friend goes there during the test, well, now you're collaborating and, and you might be accused of cheating. So just be really careful. My suggestion is any like digital notes that you're using, I would just download them onto your computer so they're offline. So you don't even have to worry about someone thinking you were going somewhere else anyway. Okay, so the first part of this, there's three parts of this. So I'm gonna talk very fast. Uh, there's colonialism and resistance in the Western hemisphere. And I'm gonna kind of go back a little bit to 1450 and bring it up to 1900. So basically um, a few reminders, right? We have powerful states in Afro-Eurasia. Indian Ocean trade is still really important, but we discovered the Americas and that obviously changes a lot of things. So North American colonies are generally more independent from Europe than Latin American colonies. There's a few reasons for that. One is that they were founded by a constitutional monarchy. Um, so they are allowed to kind of set up some basic governing structures for themselves. Um, two is a lot of these are settler colonies where a lot of the North American colonists are moving there to live and stay forever, like the Puritans. Whereas in Latin America, a lot of them were younger men coming to get rich and then go back home. Um, and so there's this, there's this settlement and this permanence of the settlements in North America to where you now have generations kind of descending down and like developing their own culture and their own practices. Some people also say that North American colonies were, were more independent and more ready for kind of democracy because they were Protestant, but I think that's really problematic. It's sometimes called in textbooks, the Protestant work ethic, which makes it seem like just Protestants work harder than every other religion. And I think that's crazy. What it means though, is that Protestant Christianity really emphasizes individualism. So it really emphasizes 
like you yourself can pray to God. You can talk directly to God. You can read the Bible for yourself in the language that you read. It doesn't have to be Latin. Um, and the only thing that determines how you get into heaven is how well you do in this life, like how, how good of a Christian you are. And so there is this element of like Protestants also tend to be, they transition over to being entrepreneurs or capitalists very quickly because it's that same sort of sentiment. It's not that they work harder. It's just that their system is set up to give them some more independence. Um, and so all these North American colonies, which are going to become mostly the United States, basically had 100 or 150 years of practice governing themselves before they're going to rebel. This is different than in Latin America, where they were still governed by an absolute monarchy of Spain. Everything was either the property of the crown or the church. Um, and they had very little power and very little opportunity to rule themselves, except when Napoleon conquers their king for a few years, right? So again, a lot of this is stuff that is mostly going to be like context or helping explain why other things occur. Um, a common opportunity for complexity is let's say you were talking about the causes of revolutions um, and you wanted to that or the effects of revolutions and you wanted to say the American Revolution set up a more stable government than the South American revolutions. Complexity and making a good argument would be saying why and you could bring some of this stuff in. So don't stress too much about like American history, but um, European colonizers were met with indigenous resistance from the beginning. Here's just a few examples. So we have in New England, the American colonists were, were met with resistance from in Medicom's war. Do you need to know any details about Medicom's war? No, you just need to know that it was Native Americans rebelling and fighting against the American colonists and they lost, right? Um, in the Inca, they had to fight for 40 years before the, before the Spanish conquered the Inca. And later on, we're going to have Tupac Amaru II, who leads another rebellion. It fails. Uh, the one that is successful, so I think this is a really cool example to know, is that um, Queen Nanny of the Maroons. So she was a previously enslaved woman. She became a Maroon or like an escaped slave or a free Black who set up these societies. She set up in Jamaica um, and she became a leader of this Maroon community. And she actually like fought the English for years and got her town some autonomy. She's now on the $500 bill in Jamaica. So that's like a rare example of a successful indigenous resistance, um, which is cool. Okay, Woo, talking fast. European colonizers were also met with colonial resistance, right? So the American Revolution. I'm gonna just move on because I think we know the American Revolution. Declaration of Independence is a very important document. It really sets the groundwork. It is the first real document that puts into action a lot of these enlightenment ideals and a lot of other Founding documents and revolutionary documents basically copy and paste. For example, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man was written by Lafayette. I made a whole music video about him because I'm obsessed with him. And Lafayette was like good friends with Thomas Jefferson. So he literally like asked him for help writing their declaration. So anyway. Latin American colonists were inspired then by the American Revolution. So if you're writing an essay about revolutions, about Latin America or the French Revolution or later movements, Super easy context is always the American Revolution. The American Revolution is kind of the first. Um, we show that you can fight back against this like big mercantilist British empire and win. Um, although we're not actually gonna institute a ton of change as we'll see. So a lot of local leaders around Latin America capitalized on chaos in Europe as Napoleon was Napoleoning around Europe to try to assert their own independence. So these are three kind of the famous leaders. There are more. There's Simon Bolivar. There's also Juan de San, Mar San Martin. Um, and so uh, these are led by Creoles. And so in a lot of ways, oh, Heimler's here. Hey, Heimler, how's it going? I was watching yours too, it was awesome. Um, okay, so um, a lot of these are Creole led in a, and in a lot of ways that means they're similar to the American Revolution. I like to explain revolutions. When I teach this in my class, I just draw a ton of triangles and my students are like, oh my God, please stop. And so I say in most societies, right? You have the ones, you have the twos and you have the threes. This is gonna look like a toddler did this, but. Um, but so what happens is in most revolutions, the twos lead the way and they rile up the threes and they're like, doesn't this suck? This sucks so bad, right? And the threes are all like, this sucks. And then the twos become the generals and whatever. And all they do, oh, is just get rid of the ones. I meant to just erase that first thing. But so all they do is end up with this. So the ones are now gone, but like now the twos are on top and the threes are still at the bottom. It's not very radical, not very revolutionary. So in the American Revolution, this happened, right? George Washington was not a peasant. He owned many slaves. Um, and same thing, Simon Bolivar is a Creole. On the casta system, it's the second to the top, right? And so all they do is get rid of the peninsulares, but they still have this kind of rigid structure and a lot of people at the bottom. So in a lot of ways, some of those revolutions were not actually that radical. They didn't really change much about the social hierarchy. However, 
oh, hey, complexity. Uh, one exception would be Haiti, right? That's why Haiti is so important is because it's an exception in a lot of ways. It is like really kind of the first successful large scale slave rebellion. Um, and it sets up the first black Republic. Uh, and so this is an example of like, they literally flipped the social hierarchy on its head, which also explains why Haiti is less stable. Its government is less stable in the, in the following years because obviously the people at the top now, by definition, were not given any opportunities to rule themselves because they were enslaved. Um, Mexico is not something that the college board really talks about a lot, which is crazy to me, but Mexico is kind of a mix of both. So it started off pretty radical. Father Hidalgo tried to get the peasants and the indigenous people to overthrow the Spanish. Once the Creoles realized they were winning, the Creoles just switched sides and joined them. So it ends up being not super radical. The point is that this is one of the things that the AP exam wants you to do is they want you to evaluate relative to each other. So if they ask you a question about the impact of the revolutions, yeah, you could just say the impact was they all got independence, but that's super simple. A more complex answer would be to say, well, they all got independence, but some like created more radical change than others. Here are the ones that more radically changed. Here are the ones that did it, right? Um, okay. So we also see, um, I just want us to situate the United States. As soon as the United States becomes a country, we immediately basically become Europe. We basically start trying to become Europe as much as we possibly can. And I want you to notice if you've been paying attention to my last few cram sessions, um, the United States has been paying attention too and just adopts all those kind of traditional elements of state building and they just do them really quickly in the 1800s. So we're a small state that rose due to trade and innovation right? New England, shipping and trading, the South, the cash crops. We create a strict social hierarchy based on race, right? We have chattel slavery with African Americans. We have Native Americans forced onto reservations. And we, over time, throughout the 1800s, build a powerful empire over a diverse landmass. I put empire in quotes because it's not technically empire uh, because we annex the states, but like y'all, it's an empire. Right, I mean, like we're conquering Mexico, we're conquering Native Americans. Um, we become officially an empire in 1898 with the Spanish-American War when we take Puerto Rico and Guam and the Philippines. But the point is, I just want us to notice that a lot of times we forget that the United States is part of world history. And so if you, you get an essay in the 1800s that's talking about expansion and empire building, obviously our brains all go to Britain, right? Because they, they were, but you can also talk about the United States. Manifest destiny is like our version of the white man's burden, right? So anyway. Uh, okay, so now we trans transfer over to revolutions in Europe. You notice I didn't talk about the French Revolution. Ooh, yeah, um, someone in the chat's asking about Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez is a great guy to know. Um, he comes around in Mexico after the revolution. He's the first indigenous president of Mexico, and he's very liberal. Um, Mexico follows the tendency that a lot of Latin American countries do, which is where they keep going back and forth between like very liberal um, governments that are trying to like equalize the hierarchy and redistribute land to peasants and stuff and then like strict military governments and the key is which one the United States wants and spoiler alert the United States throughout the 18 and 1900s wants the strict military capitalist government so yeah you have someone like Benito Juarez who comes along and is trying to institute change but then the military steps in and we have a dictatorship under Porfirio Diaz None of these are things you should panic if you don't know who I'm talking about. Again, you don't need to know everything. You need to know enough to support your argument. So if you're going to make the argument that local leaders capitalized on chaos in Europe during the Napoleonic era to assert independence, well, pick one of these three and make that argument, or ideally two. So don't freak out if you're like, I don't know who Miguel Hidalgo is. That's okay. Just make sure you know who Simon Bolivar is. Okay, so you notice I haven't talked about the French Revolution yet. I'm going to lump that in more with kind of European developments because, you know, it's in Europe. So the rise of Napoleon created a need for international cooperation. Actually, fun fact, I kind of just skipped the French Revolution because so does the College Board. So uh, the French Revolution is now purely in the realm of AP Euro. We talk about the French Revolution as a... Um, it's inspired by the American Revolution. Their document is inspired by the Declaration of Independence. But really the important impact of the French Revolution for world history right now, because they end up back with a monarch, right? Not a lot actually changes, is Napoleon. So the rise of Napoleon out of the chaos of the reign of terror, he then Napoleons around Europe and tries to conquer everywhere. And that chaos does a few, it sets off a lot of chain reactions. Again, another common context I see is Napoleon. Now you can trace a lot of things back. It's like 
six degrees of Kevin Bacon, which y'all might not even know who that is now, you can do like six degrees of Napoleon and trace a lot of different events in the 1800s back to Napoleon and have that as context. So when he goes around and conquers, he then, um, first, he is not really paying attention to his colony, Haiti, one, so they rebel. Two, he conquers Spain and puts the Spanish king in prison. And so the Latin American colonies kind of rebel on his behalf, but then are like, but actually we just wanna be independent anyway. But then he obviously tries to invade Russia in winter and it's a terrible idea and he loses, he gets exiled. He comes back, he loses, he gets exiled. So um, the big thing here is that Napoleon kind of like in a lot of ways is a wake up call for these European powers. These European powers have been so focused on each other and their own region and fighting for Protestant versus Catholic and 30 years war and blah, seven years war and blah, blah, blah. Napoleon is sort of like their Genghis Khan. He like wipes the slate clean is like, I've conquered all of you and now I'm gone. You got to figure out how you're going to like rebuild this region. And so this Congress of Vienna is a really important event where they basically all get together and kind of like they're going to do in the Berlin conference later with Africa, they kind of just divide themselves up. They say, look, we got the whole world to conquer. We don't need to spend so much time focusing on fighting each other. Let's just create this idea of like a European balance of power. We're gonna draw the map so that no one nation becomes so much more powerful than the others that they can take over, you know, cut to Hitler. But anyway, um, and so they create, Germany is gonna rise and sort of slowly get created out of this. This is why Switzerland is a thing right in the middle of everywhere and very neutral. Um, they're gonna kind of divide up a lot of these places and they're gonna really promote the unity of like Italy and Germany to provide stability in Europe. And so they basically say like, let's just kind of keep this balance of power. And now we can all, instead of watching our backs all the time, we can go out and just divide up the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is like, we're good. So uh, industrialization also begins in England. So you have this like rising kind of unity and um, you have this right, sorry, this rising uh, context of like unity across Europe. They're not fighting so many wars against each other. They can focus more on innovation. The, it starts in England for a lot of reasons. You can go find tons of resources on that. Essentially it's like coal. They have a lot of money from the slave trade and they have colonies and waterways, but and they have a, a constitutional monarchy. There's a real big reason why capitalism rises more quickly in dem democratic states or constitutional states. Because if you're a business person and you wanna invest and start this new business, you're more likely to take risk if you feel like your property will be protected by the constitution. So if you're in Spain at the same time, like the king can do whatever he wants. He's still an absolute monarch. So that's why you don't see the rise of industrialization or kind of early capitalism in other parts. It's not that Spanish people are less likely to do these things. It's, uh, or less like able to do these things. It's that in a place like England, you have the rule of law. You've had it kind of since the Magna Carta. And so people feel more comfortable taking risks. You also have a government that has for a long time sponsored these sorts of risks like with joint stock companies. Anyway, so first the industrialization, industrial revolution begins because they just want to reproduce what Asia is making. They just want to not have to pay so much for these luxurious Asian goods. So it starts with textiles, um, like weaving fabrics and that sort of thing. And it also starts with porcelain. So Josiah Wedgwood is a really important dude. Um, he made like tea sets that um, essentially mimicked Chinese, right? Fine China, porcelain. Um, but he, he kind of used the principles of mass production for the first time. He kind of divided up the labor, the labor and he made it to where things could be made more cheaply. So now, again, connecting different things together, the rising middle class in England, this changing social hierarchy, they wanna have the stuff rich people have, but they can't afford it. Rich people get actual fine China from China, middle class people get Wedgwood China. Um, so. Then it moves on and they're like, oh, this technology could be useful for more than just like fabrics and porcelain. And they start creating things like the steam engine and steel. And so the first industrial revolution, the early part is more focused on these sort of like kind of luxury goods and, and just developing the technology. The later industrial revolution that starts kind of in the 1800s is gonna be about like trains and steamboats and that sort of thing. Um, should you know specific names like Wedgwood? Yeah, it'd be cool, especially since you have your notes, right? So again, like you don't have to know everyone, but you should know some what they call illustrative examples. So if you're going to talk in an essay about industrialization and like how that led to more efficient things, um, the more efficient production of things, 
pulling out a name like Josiah Wedgwood would be great. I also am kind of predicting that the college board's going to be a little pickier this year with their evidence, their additional evidence, because you have your notes and you have the internet. So like, right. I mean, if you can't come up with a name, I've been telling my students to ignore the internet, pretend it doesn't exist unless you're just trying to be like, what's that guy's name. So if you can find the answer through a Google search where you don't have to click on anything, fine. But otherwise I'm telling my kids like, don't click on any sites. Like you don't know what sites they're watching. You can in theory use the internet. It's not cheating, but you just don't want to end up on a site that's like collaborative and you didn't realize it. So again, a lot of these like what you can have your notes. So you can literally have this PowerPoint as you take the test or have your notes. So I think they are going to expect that you can pull out some pretty specific examples to support your argument because like you have it all there, right? That's where like studying content is still important. So industrialization spreads across Europe and other parts of the West. And I just want you to notice it often spreads first to states that are relatively young. So some of the first states it spreads to are the US, Belgium, and Germany that are all kind of creating creating their state as industrialization is happening. And so it makes sense that as they're kind of building their new state, they're going to adopt the newest technology, as opposed to a state like China or the Ottoman Empire that's been around for a long time and their systems are like entrenched, it's going to be harder, they're slower to change, it's going to be harder for them to get going. Um, they're mostly, a lot of them are Protestant. Again, doesn't mean Protestants are better, it just means their that denomination really emphasizes like individualism and entrepreneurism and that sort of thing. And a lot of these are culturally connected to England in some way, the United States being the obvious example. Okay. Uh, industrialized states now have significantly more power. So what's happening is it's like a double whammy, right? Europe is becoming more unified in the wake of the Napoleonic era and they're industrializing. So they have unity back at home to some extent. There are still wars in Europe in the 1800s, but still. Um, but they also now have a lot more power to go out and conquer other parts of the world. So you have steamships and then trains and industrialized weaponry. So you want to think about a place like Africa, right? Where they've, I mean, Europe has been interacting with Africa for thousands of years, right? Um, and Europe has been interested in Africa for hundreds of years. But notice like the Portuguese were just able to kind of like go along the coast and set up these port cities, this kind of trading post empire. They get around, Vasco da Gama is so excited. And then they make it to India. And they never really make it that far inland. And most of the reason is geography. It's just really freaking hard. It's dense and it's rainforest and it's jungle. Um, and so now when you have steamships that can power their way up these rivers um, or down these rivers, right? Um, actually up because the Nile flows this way, but whatever. Um, you also have trains. You can start laying down train tracks and it's a way easier way on steamships and train tracks to get raw materials out. Whereas before you'd have to do it like by hand and that doesn't really make sense. And then obviously you have the like industrialization of military devices. So you have the Gatling gun, which is essentially an early machine gun. And so, um, cause again, Africans had guns, right? A lot of the slave traders traded them guns for slaves. So they had a lot of those things. It's not like they were in these super primitive states. Remember they were in powerful trading empires but industrialization really like turns the scales in favor of Europe. Um, so industrialization also helps unite their own nation. So industrial states also get this third benefit of becoming more physically and then kind of psychologically united. And so there's a really like a document that I love that's from Germany in like the 1870s, right after they united. And it's a big document where the government is saying like, hop on a train and explore your new nation of Germany. And it's kind of like promoting tourism, but it's saying like, we want you to see your nation and see it as yours and it's united and you're all going to like serve it. And eventually you might fight for it if you need to and that sort of thing. And so as you get more physically connected, that's just easier to facilitate. So this, these two maps right here are showing railroads. And so this is like railroad track that was laid. So the first is in 1848. Uh, and then this is just 30 years later. That's insane. That's insane growth, right? And think about how much more power now these European states will have first in warfare, right? Being able to transport goods um, across Europe, but also just in like trade, right? I mean, being able to trade with other nations, get wealthier, being able to get information spread more quickly. Infrastructure is really a really important part of history that no one talks about because roads are kind of boring. So here are just some examples. Again, these are all like illustrative examples that you could use if you wanted to for infrastructure that helps connect states together. You'll notice one of these, like the radio was invented in 1901, 
that's fine, right? If you get a DBQ that's asking you about industrialization and you go 1901, even though technically the test ends in 1900, that's okay. Now, if you talk about planes, well, no, that's not really part of it or cars or whatever. Um, but so if you're talking about on this prompt, right? You can go a little bit beyond the time period and they'll probably be pretty nice to you. Uh, urbanization is also bringing people together. So in 1825, London becomes the most populous city in the world for the first time. Um, and so th that's another really good piece of specific evidence that could be evidence for the rising power of England in relation to Asia, right? Because it's one of those weird things, the AP exam, like they want you to prove that these things happened in history, even though you're like, well, they did. And we all know you have to prove it with specifics. So if you're going to make an argument that the 1800s saw the rise of Europe and the decline of Asia, you're still going to have to prove that. You can't just say that. I know it's true. You know it's true. But you have to prove it. A piece of evidence would be, for example, um, early on in the century, London became the largest city in the world as opposed to Beijing. Boom. Now you've proved it at least to some extent that that's kind of true. Um, Another great question about dates. Are they relevant? No, but they're relevant for context. So you don't have to pull out dates on the AP exam. Um, they're not gonna ask you about dates or anything like that, but they are helpful for sourcing documents. So it is important to have like some marker events. If you wanna have a basic timeline with just some like big picture events from each time period, because if you get a source, like let's say you get a document that's set in Germany in the 1870s, like I said, it would be helpful to know that that was right after Germany became a state, like a few years after. Or if there's a document set in British India in 1858, it might be helpful to go like, oh, that's one year after the Sepoy mutiny. That might explain why they're talking about what they're talking about. So dates on their own don't matter, but they're helpful for context, um, figuring out like, okay, if this thing happened then, then what happened before it? And also for sourcing those documents, because one of the points you can get on that uh, sourcing the documents point is like situating the document within its historical context. So in the document I just mentioned where it's like the German state promoting people to get on trains and travel across the new state of Germany, if I said something like, um, well, it's important to note that this document was written just a few years after Germany unified. And so it makes sense, like they're doing everything they can to try to kind of force this unity on the German people um, and so that's why they're encouraging everyone to like get out and explore and use the new trains and that sort of thing. So, um, okay. New European states are um, united under new powerful leadership. Sorry, my, my thing, I have like a little toolbar that was just covering that sentence up, which is why it looked like I couldn't read for a second. They use a thing called a uh, real politic or real politique. Some people make it fancier, um, which basically just is kind of, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like what a modern politics is. It's just the idea of like practicality over ideology. So you have some leaders who are like, I want to rule with this philosophy. Like I'm a socialist ruler. I'm a whatever ruler, an absolute ruler. And in Italy and Germany, they were like, I just want to rule. Like I just want to be, in, I just want to be in power. I want to unite Germany together. However, I need to do that. I don't really care. I'm just going to do it. The best example of that is Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck was sort of a um, visionary leader. So he basically just started a bunch of wars as when he was the head of Prussia, which was kind of part of that Holy Roman Empire, just started a bunch of wars with other states, kind of knowing he would win. And then he could like start to piece together his new state of what's gonna become Germany. But then he also put in place in the 1870s and 1880s, a lot of kind of socialist reforms. He also was very smart and practical in that he saw the rise of, right, Karl Marx was in Germany, he was German. And so he saw the rise of these movements of like people predicting that the industrial workers are not gonna be okay with this bad treatment for long and they're at some point gonna rebel. Otto von Bismarck was aware of that. So again, he didn't really care about ideology. He just said, what can I do to make my state united? So Otto von Bismarck also put in place like an early version of healthcare, um, workers' rights and workers' comp, like all these things to keep workers happy, partly because he read Karl Marx and was like, oh shoot, I don't want that to happen here. Um, and so Karl Marx just like packs up his bag and moves to Russia, not physically, but ideologically. So that's real politic. It's sort of like, I don't really care as long as we get stuff done and as long as we can be a strong nation. Um, Count de Cavour did the same thing in Italy. I know very little about him. I just know he kind of helped unify Italy. So that's a thing too. 
All right. Um, other states also adopt industrialization and Western style um, practices to maintain power. Um, so <clears throat> I put these three states next to each other because I really do want to have us understand, right? Like, even though we're not going to talk about the 20th century, that like the 20th century is created obviously in, in the 1800s. And so I want us to notice how similar these three states that are going to become three of the most powerful states in the 20th century. Um, yes, we will talk about the scramble for Africa, don't worry. Um, so how similar these three states are down to like the years. So the United States abolishes slavery in 1863. There's many reasons for that, but also it's sort of we're modernizing. Our economy is modernizing. One of the uncomfortable truths is that we partly abolished slavery in the 1860s because by then we kind of could. We had enough technology that we didn't actually need slave labor as much as we did 50 years earlier. Russia abolishes their serfs in 1861, two years earlier, right? Um, Japan abolishes their feudal classes, including the samurai. Uh, let me actually look this up. Abolition of samurai in Japan uh, in, let's say, 1868. So literally in the same decade around the world, in the 1860s, you have three states that are getting on board and are like, we got to get with it. We got to cut ties with some of these old, more traditional kind of feudal structures and like move towards the future. And so literally we like abolish slavery, abolish the serfs, abolish the feudal classes, and then turn around and like start building railroads and start industrializing. So this also would be a great example of complexity in an essay is being able to connect these states together, right? So it's it's a lot easier to just say, well, if we're talking about industrialization, Japan industrialized with the Meiji Restoration. But what would be even cooler and what will really impress the graders if you can say, to contextualize this, a similar process was happening in the United States, right? And it's two things that like on the surface aren't that connected, but you're showing that you kind of understand that this process was occurring kind of all around the globe at the same time. Notice that even though they abolish like slavery and serfs and that sort of thing, they still rely on some form of coerced labor, whether that's new immigrant labor that's paid very little or whether that's kind of prison labor like in Siberia. Um, so again, our transcontinental railroad that was finished in 1869 is another good piece of evidence because it's an example of modernization and industrialization. It's an example of trying to connect our quote unquote empire from sea to shining sea. And it's also a great example of using immigrant labor. You have the Irish building from the east to the west and the Chinese building from the west to the east and they meet in the middle. So um, yeah, we're gonna go over and talk about like the, the big guys, the Ottoman empire, we're talking about the scramble for Africa, that sort of thing in a second. So um, social movements respond to industrialization. So we should see all of the 1800s is the era of imperialism, but it's also the era of social movements. And in fact, that was one of the topics of the APUSH DPQ last week was social reforms in the 1800s. So you have the abolition movement um, that's closely connected to the women's rights movement because women get more politically active and informed kind of for the first time in fighting for the abolition of slavery. So then once they kind of get that, they turn around and use those same practices on themselves. Um, a lot of this starts with the revolutions, right? You have these enlightened revolutions where um, men are saying all these great things about equality and freedom. And meanwhile, half the population is like, that's cute, what about us? So you have documents like Olympe de Gouges writes the Declaration of the Rights of Woman. It is like a basically a satire. It's kind of like a big screw you to Lafayette's Declaration of the Rights of Man. You have Mary Wollstonecraft, who's an English Enlightenment philosopher who's writing a vindication of the rights of women. Um, a woman that's arguing that like women aren't dumber than men, they're just not allowed to like learn what men are allowed to learn. Um, and then you have sort of the beginning of the women's suffrage movement in the world, but especially in the US, is this Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. So again, I'm putting these dates in here just because context is key. And so if you're reading a document and it is written by an American woman in the 1850s and she's talking about voting, well, you might go, this makes sense because she probably, like we just had this convention that established that like women should have the right to vote. And so again, dates don't matter except for being able to situate events within their, their time period. And I will say dates are the most useful in the 1800s because so much happens, right? So much stuff in the 1800s that I find at least writing down some of these dates, or again, on the test, you can Google the date. What date is the Sika Falls Convention and just find it. Um, just because a few years can make a big difference, right? A few years go by and now Germany wasn't a thing and now they are a thing. 
or uh, slavery existed and slavery doesn't exist. And so that's where in the earlier time periods, I wasn't putting up a lot of years because we're talking more in big, broad strokes. By the time we get to the 1800s, there's like a lot going on and a lot of it's happening on top of each other. So there's a lot of good opportunities for context. For example, the same year as the Seneca Falls Convention, which was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the Communist Manifesto was published by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. So again, this is these are all part of this like rising social movements responding to industrialization and kind of the dehumanization of workers and people and, and societies and communities as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Um, let me scam real quick. Oh, Trans-Siberian Railroad. Yeah, it connected Russia all the way over to like um, Manchuria, right? So it, it was a big threat to Japan and to China, which is by Japan's gonna fight a war. They fight a war against China, win, and then they fight a war against Russia. So yeah, that's Russia attempting to kind of expand its influence into Asia. Whereas we all have to sail there, the Russians just have to build a train, train track long enough. All right, Whew. okay, I'm gonna pause for a second before we talk about the age of imperialism. I am going to um, kind of skim through the chat and just see there's anything else we're going to talk about China in a second. We're talking about the Boxer Rebellion. Um, this PowerPoint, I think, is already posted on my website. But if not, it'll be posted right after this. Um, let's see. Yes, don't try for complexity. You either do it or you don't. But you shouldn't worry about it on Thursday. Um, let's see. And yeah, we're going to talk about Chi Chi. Y'all are asking a lot of great questions about China. Just like, just chill. Just give me, give me a second, right? I promise I'm getting there. We talked about the revolutions. Now we're going to talk about industrialization. Or we just talked. Now we're going to talk about imperialism. Okay, um, so oof. here are the different types of imperialism. Um, this isn't something you need to memorize. It's just something to be aware of that there are different kinds. Um, so in general, you just want to think about there's like traditional colonial imperialism, which is kind of what we think of. It's like another state saying, we control you now and you are kind of beneath us. Um, within that, you have settler and non-settler colonies. And really just what that means is like, you have places where they don't maybe intend to stay there forever, or really the main purpose is to get raw materials out. And then you have other places where they're starting to like send some of their people to live. So the American colonies were a British settler colony. So was French Algeria. So was British South Africa, Australia. Basically the places that are still kind of part of the British Commonwealth were mostly settler colonies. One of the reasons was partly just geography, latitudes. So you notice that like the British, for example, settle in places that in terms of their latitude are more similar to like a Mediterranean climate. So they're like, eh, I don't want to live in like Central Africa, but I'll live in South Africa or New Zealand or Australia. Same with French Algeria. Algeria is beautiful and right on the Mediterranean. So it's basically places where they wanted to go and like take vacations. Um, for the most part, then in a non-settler colony like India or the Congo, um, the British or the European people that are there are just officials. They're there for a job. They're working to administer the empire and then they want to go home at some point. So that's why you see more cultural syncretism and more like creating some unique culture or European culture kind of really influencing settler colonies as opposed to these places where um, they don't necessarily set down a lot of cultural roots. Then you obviously have economic imperialism, <coughs> which means... Um, you don't actually directly control a place, but you like effectively do. So it's the US and Latin America. The US and Latin America from the 1800s on, Latin American countries know that like whatever decision they make that has to do with the economy or trade or foreign relations, the US is gonna have something to say about it, right? And they, so they have to kind of operate within that sphere of influence. They know that if they say something like, let's nationalize the oil or let's nationalize the fruit company's land and give it to peasants. They know the United States is gonna have something to say about it or more likely is gonna have some Marines to like send in and overthrow you. It's in the 20th century, but still. So that's getting set up in the 1800s, the Monroe Doctrine, um, basically Monroe in the 1810s, I can't remember the exact year, 1816, 1817. He basically says like, hey, stay out Europe, the Americas are ours. He says it like he's protecting the Americas as new independent states, but we all know it's really like, no, that's gonna be ours one day. Um, yeah, a lot of people are asking, you can get these slides uh, on my website, antisocialstudies.org. I'll type it in here again. And then I'm also gonna post um, this video on my YouTube as soon as we're done. Uh, another great example of economic imperialism is going to be China with their spheres of influence. And we'll get there in a second. So. Uh, reasons for imperialism. This is a great example of nuance. Um, 
really the reasons for imperialism were economics. They were economics. It was like they wanted raw materials for industrialization. They wanted markets to sell their stuff. They wanted to prove they were the strongest and the biggest, their nation was the best. But they justify that imperialism through more cultural and more racist ideologies. So social Darwinism is a big one here. Um, so this idea of a civilizing mission that somehow Europeans are more civilized than non-Europeans, that's gonna develop into scientific racism. Um, and a lot of that comes again as context, it comes from Darwin. So Darwin in 1859 publishes on the origin of the species. He doesn't talk about people, he talks about birds. I don't know if Darwin was a racist. I mean, he was a white British dude in the 1800s, so probably, but, um, but the point is that at this time, um, when Darwin publishes his theories of like survival of the fittest and that sort of thing, um, if you are a white European colonizer and you're looking around at the world, if you apply that to your situation, you're going to say, well, we must just be fitter, right? And so again, it's sort of the rise of this false science of racism. The idea even that races are biologically different from each other, right? When they're really not. Um, but so this whole idea that certain races are biologically superior or more further along on the evolutionary scale justifies and, and to some people explains imperialism to where they go, oh, well, that makes sense. They, they need us. They, they can't do these things on their own, which we all know is BS because we've been watching Asia and Africa thrive for me in history thousands of years, but whatever. So the real reason is economics. Um, they want raw materials for their factories and they want people that have to buy their goods and they want to convert people to become Christian. And a lot of them genuinely believe they're like saving their souls. So fine. But, um, but for the most part, it's money, but then they use kind of cult, this perceived cultural superiority to justify it. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, he's, here are two dinky maps that I made for my students. And I just figured I'd throw on here just to understand how resources are changing. <clears throat> so um, if you notice, like in the first era, 1450 to 1750, when the Europeans are going out on ships, they're mostly looking for luxury goods. They're looking for spices. They're looking for cotton, silk, tea, porcelain, kind of like the finer things because trade was very expensive and was very difficult. And so if you're going to carry something all the way back on this, on one of those big, like, I don't know, Portuguese caravels or something, um, you're not going to bring back something super heavy that's not worth a lot. You're going to bring back silk. But now, because of industrialization and travel is cheaper and more efficient, it's sort of a circle. It's like a chicken in the egg. That means they can bring back more raw materials that might not have been cost effective before. And also, they need new types of materials to feed their industrial factories. So now we're looking for places that have stuff like rubber, uh, copper, palm oil is really important for like oiling and, and kind of greasing the machinery. Um, that sort of thing. And so you notice that that's why we're getting way more involved in places like Africa. Africa is cursed because they are blessed with natural resources. Um, guano is really important in Peru and I can't for the life of me remember why. If someone remembers why guano was like bat, that's bat poop, was important, please tell me there's some reason. Um, okay. Sorry that your brain hurts after both our videos. I totally understand. My brain hurts from just talking this long. Okay. Uh, how did the telegraph go under over water? It didn't, it went underwater. They buried it in the bottom of the ocean. Isn't that cool? Um, there's still like wires and cables and stuff that connect like the US with Britain and stuff. So they buried these under the ocean and they laid these telegraph wires over time, which is so freaking cool. Um, and it was the important thing, right? Was to connect with their colonies. Okay. Guano is a fertilizer. Okay, that makes sense. Sure, helping crops grow. Awesome. Okay, um, I just feel like you know you can find poop anywhere, but I guess guano is like I guess Peruvian guano is especially good. I don't know. Um, the other thing that's happening too is we have human migrations occurring. <clears throat> I promise I'm getting to China and India and all those places in a second. Um, so as these empires grow, it's easier for people within the empire to move around. And in fact, a lot of times the mother country encourages that. So we see a lot of Indian migrations, right? Indian people moving to East and Southern Africa. Gandhi, for example, first practices law in South Africa. Um, we see Indians moving to Australia until they're not allowed to anymore. We see Indians ending up in parts of South America and the Caribbean as well. Um, and so places that were controlled by the British. Um, Italians go mostly to the United States Northeast and they go mostly to then Argentina. 
Um, and obviously you have like the Scott Irish coming along um, partly after rebellion, failed rebellions. They come over and then help win the American Revolution. If anyone's watching Outlander, you know what I'm talking about. But also the Irish potato famine, other, other things make them come here. Um, another main one is Chinese immigrants because of the chaos happening in China, right? We're going to talk in a second about the Taiping Rebellion and all these different movements. So a lot of them leave and try to find better economic opportunities. A lot of them go to Southeast Asia, but a lot of them obviously end up in the Pacific um, in the United States. The Japanese um, are also expanding and they are kind of migrating for the purposes of possibly setting up colonies which is one of the reasons why the United States very quickly annexes Hawaii kind of out of nowhere, because we're like, oh shoot, we want it before the Japanese get it. Um, and same thing, they're getting a little more involved. There's Japanese people in Cuba. Um, and so we're like, oh, okay, war with Spain so we can get Cuba ourselves. So a lot of this is context too, for understanding why the United States, for example, in the second half of the 1800s really started branching out and like annexing some places that geographically don't make a lot of sense. It's because they were trying to, um, prevent those places from being taken by other people that they maybe didn't want close to them. Then of course, on the other end of this, we have reactions to these new immigrants. And so the two best and worst examples are in the United States and Australia. So the United States had this rising um, movement called nativism, which does not mean Native Americans. The Native Americans were like, that's rich. It meant people who had been born in the United States, but were typically white. And so um, there was a rising, there was a political party in the 1840s and 50s called the Native American Party, but it was like a white, like racist party. Um, and so they start to kind of turn away and advocate for not allowing certain immigrants to come in. Our first piece of immigration legislation ever in our history was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and so we were fine with people coming from Protestant places. We we're fine with kind of white Northwestern Europeans. But as soon as we start getting Italians, Italians are heavily discriminated against. They were subject to Jim Crow laws in the South too. And Chinese coming over to the West were like, mm, we got to start monitoring our immigration policies. Same thing in Australia. They literally had a policy that was called the white Australia policy. Just keep it white, right? Don't let non-white people in. Let's see. Okay, so this is... <laughs> the page where um, I'm going to try to answer some questions that y'all have, right? So these are some key moments in imperialism where if you are kind of worried about dates, these are some key dates that could be really helpful for like situating yourself in the 1800s if you get a DBQ. And some of you are going to get a DBQ in the 1800s. You have There has to be at least one from this time period. So who knows? But so these are just some key dates that might be helpful to know, again, in terms of contextualizing documents. So as y'all are kind of looking at these dates, I'll go, go through a few of these events, right? So people get confused with China because China like explodes and loses their mind for like 60 years. So it all starts with the Opium Wars, right? Um, I'm not gonna go in detail about the Opium Wars, but it's England trying to rebalance trade by smuggling in illegal opium. Um, cool, thanks England. They fight a series of wars and England wins and they win, they don't conquer China because they don't want to rule China, but they win special trading benefits Fits. Um, they start to get like spheres of influence along the coast. They get most favored nation status. Essentially, the British are now kind of dictating to the Chinese emperors what they want them to do, which if you know anything about Chinese history is insane. And the Chinese people are like, no, thank you. The trick with China is that they do respond. They do kind of rebel against this kind of slight imperialism, but they respond in different ways and they're not united. And that's why it's so confusing for students to keep track of is because there's a lot of things happening at once. So you have the Taiping Rebellion, which is like a peasant rebellion to overthrow the emperor. You should look into the guy that started it, um, Hong Shu Quan, because he started it because he saw a vision after he failed his Confucian exams for the fourth time. And he believed that he was Jesus's younger brother. So it's like, it's real fast. Go look up Hong Shu Quan. He's awesome and fascinating. But it kind of escalates into this massive peasant rebellion trying to overthrow the emperor. Um, so there, the peasants are doing that, and then the state is trying to put down that rebellion. Some of the Confucian scholars say, you know what, we maybe need to get on board with this industrialization thing. That's the self-strengthening movement. That's basically their version of the Meiji Restoration, where they're like, well, we should just try to kind of adopt some of these policies from within. But a lot of other scholars reject that and say, no, we're Confucian. Like, we don't, we don't care what's going on in the outside world. We want to stick with traditional China. And then you obviously have the Empress Shishi, who is just like sticking her head in the sand. She spends all the money they were going to spend on a navy on building a marble boat in her palace. So 
Um, so the trick with China is it's just like a disjointed response. And that's why China is so confusing. And that's why there's also so many Chinese people kind of fleeing that chaos to other places. <clears throat> We're going to talk more. I'm going to kind of rank the responses to westernization in China. Full disclosure is going to be on the low end of that. But another, another event in the 1800s that's very useful in a lot of ways is the Crimean War. This is another one of those pieces of evidence that you can apply to a lot of different things. So the Crimean War could be an example of Russian expansionism. The Russian Empire is growing. They're trying to take over Crimea, which Putin finally did a few years ago. Um, and they're also, it's also evidence of the declining power of the Ottoman Empire. So at this point, the Ottomans are losing their ability to control a lot of the kind of outside regions like Eastern Europe. And that's where Crimea is, right? And so this could be evidence of the decline of Europe, um, that they're kind of losing control over this land. And this could be evidence of the rise of Russia. But it's also um, a really interesting war because the Ottomans in the end win but they only win because Britain and France has to step in and help them out. Um, and so that's super embarrassing to the Ottomans. And this prompts their Tanzimat reforms. This prompts the Ottomans to go, oh shoot y'all, like we gotta get on this. And so again, this is really helpful context for understanding why a state like the Ottomans that's existed for hundreds of years and thrived under kind of tradition, now all of a sudden goes, oh shoot, some of their sultans are like, we gotta start westernizing. And the Crimean War is kind of the moment that like sparks that for them. You also see um, 1858 is the beginning of the British Raj in India. 1858-59 is that Sepoy Rebellion where they say, okay, fine, we're not just going to have it be British East India Company. We're going to go in and control it ourselves. Obviously, a very important event is the Berlin Conference in 1885. This is where they kind of, the scramble for Africa has been occurring for decades, but this is where they formalize it and say, like, you get this land, you get this land, and they screw up Africa in the process. But you also have Japan. They found a colonization society in 1893 where they're starting to send people out around the Pacific to kind of settle there and maybe establish some ties to eventually become part of a Japanese empire, uh, cut to World War II, US versus Japan. And then obviously the Spanish-American War is sort of the beginning of American official imperialism where we get control of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and we get indirect control over Cuba. Whew. Okay, so. Got a little bit more to go. Responses to imperialism, indigenous groups resist. Uh, you can look at this map later. Here are some good examples of both. They resist with violence. The Indian Rebellion of 1857, that's also called the Sepoy Mutiny, that is unsuccessful. Ya Ashantewa is like a, a queen that fights against the British in the Gold Coast, which becomes Ghana. She's successful for a very long time, but eventually Ghana or the Gold Coast becomes part of the British Empire. The Maori Wars are the indigenous people fighting against British influence in New Zealand. But then you also should have some examples in your back pocket of nonviolent methods of resistance. So using like culture and religious beliefs. So you have the ghost dance movement in the Great Plains where they're resisting American expansion. Um, they're, they're participating in these ghost dance events where they believe they will like raise the ghosts of their ancestors who will like force the white people out of the land. You have the Oza cattle killing movement in South Africa which is um, not successful. They basically um, kind of sacrifice their cattle um, to kind of get the white men out of South Africa, which obviously doesn't really help that at all. Um, you also have like nationalist leaders, um, cultural leaders rising up. There are two great poets during this time that are also really great evidence for talking about art or poetry or nationalism, that sort of thing. You have Jose Marti in Cuba who writes a lot of poetry inspiring Cuban nationalism and Lola Rodriguez de Tio who does the same thing for Puerto Rico. So. Um, this, these would be great examples of like rising nationalism spreading. It kind of starts in Europe, but it spreads to other parts and then comes back to like bite Europe in the butt, which again is an example of complexity to say like Europe becomes powerful because of rising nationalism, but they're also being resisted because the groups they're trying to conquer are also developing nationalism too. Okay. Um, state responses to westernization, we're kind of talking about these four big dudes. Japan's not really, but they're, they're becoming one, right? These four big guys. And really, here it is, right? If we're talking about stronger states, they have to decide how they're going to navigate this growing westernization. They're not going to get conquered outright by Europe, and they kind of know that. But they have to decide, like, how much are we going to adapt to the rise of Europe, and how much are we going to keep our tr tradition? And on the spectrum from fail to NBP, right, China fails. Um, this kind of leads to the collapse 
and the end of Chinese dynasties as we know them. Um, that's what I talked about earlier. Russia does some things, but like not nearly enough. Lenin later is gonna be like, no, had to do way more. They had some groundwork because Peter and Catherine the Great had both promoted Westernization and promoted some elements of this. But the trick with Russia, as, as with China, is that they're never willing to reform the government. This is a real key here. The states that are like, sure, we'll reform some parts of the economy, but we're not gonna give up any of our power. That doesn't work for people, right? It's like, if you give a mouse a cookie, if you give peasants some rights and stuff, they're like, they're gonna want a government that like represents them. They do abolish the serfs, but like they don't do much else. Cut to Russian revolution. Um, right in the middle is the Ottomans. The Ottomans do totally fine. I hate that they keep getting called the sick man of Europe because that's super biased. It was other Europeans saying that. Um, and they, they, they whatever. Um, the Ottomans actually really successfully reform. If you think of the Ottoman Empire, if you think of like the end result as being the nation of Turkey, then they're incredibly successful. They do start losing power over other groups with rising nationalist movements, especially in Egypt and Greece and the Balkans. But they actually are able to create kind of what's going to end up being a powerful Turkish state that's obviously smaller. The Tanzimat reforms promote religious equality. They promote education for all. Um, they promote westernization and modernization. They're sort of rejected in some ways from some of the Islamic scholars, but the government still pushes it through. And they try to promote this new type of nationalism called Ottomanism, where they try to say like, we're all Ottomans. Like, yes, you might be different ethnic groups and different whatever, but we're all part of the Ottoman empire. It's cute and it's a good try. It works in Turkey for the group that are like, they speak the same language, they're a similar ethnic group, but like people on the fringes of the Ottoman empire, like we're, we're not Ottomans, right? Um, that's where Egypt comes in, right? Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire, but by the late 1800s is really becoming its own autonomous state. And Muhammad Ali is a really important reformer for that, right? He really pushes through a lot of industrialization, the building of the Suez Canal. Um, the only reason it doesn't work is because the American Civil War screws it up. So Egypt under Muhammad Ali was getting a ton of money during the 1860s because American cotton had been blockaded and couldn't go out on the market. So the price of cotton went way up and Egypt was like, we'll be rich forever. And so they started spending a lot of money on industrialization and then the civil war ends and Southern cotton like floods the market and they're like, oh, bummer. And so they have to start like outsourcing to the British and French to help them build and manage the Suez Canal, that sort of thing, but they're trying. Um, the MVP is Japan with the Meiji Restoration Honestly, it's like a, you should know know a lot about the Meiji Restoration because it's really an example that, of just like a how to navigate this changing world successfully. Um, they adopt a lot of new technology and industry. They adopt some forms of constitutional government that are based on kind of the German model. They have a Kaiser um, or the emperor, but they still, they do have an elected government as well, but they maintain their own tradition and their culture. And they really emphasize like reverence for the emperor, loyalty to Japan, Japanese culture that creates this really powerful nation that obviously is going to go out and kind of conquer a lot of the world in the 20th century. All right. Um, so, whoa, that was so much information. Oh my God. Okay. First, this will be, this slideshow is going to be posted on my website, antisocialstudies.org. And this video will be posted on YouTube right now. What's next? Tonight, at 7, 6 central, I'm going on the Marco Learning YouTube channel to break down the rubric with John, the founder of Marco Learning. So if you are interested in kind of more details on the rubric itself, you can join us tonight at 7, 6 central, again, on the Marco Learning YouTube channel. Tomorrow at the same time at 4, 3 central, I'm doing an AMA. So I have an Instagram story up and my Instagram, which I'll put in here, is um, anti-social studies. So if you go follow that and find my story, you can submit questions to me and I will curate them and answer as many as I can tomorrow. Um, I'm already getting a lot of good questions about evidence and that sort of thing. And then at some time before Thursday, I'm gonna make a video of me. The College Board just released a practice DBQ that's like a five document practice DBQ. And so I'm gonna post a video sometime tomorrow um, of me writing it and showing you what I would write. So if you're interested in that, make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel um, so that you will see when I go live and you'll also see when I post that video. So please go follow me on Instagram at anti social studies and ask me questions on that Instagram story. Honestly, I'm not able to respond to everyone's like direct messages anymore because there's a lot more people. But if you if you reply to that story, I'll see it. Um, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can know when I'm going to be posting more videos. Um, and then check out tonight, if you're subscribed to the Marco Learning YouTube channel, 
Um, we'll be talking specifically about the rubric for AP World History um, at 7, 6 Central. Woo, okay, so go check out my website, antisocialstudies.org, where you'll find the PowerPoint that, of this, and then um, you'll be able to find this recording later if you wanna watch it again for some reason or share it with people who weren't able to be here today. All right, oh my gosh, thanks y'all. Hopefully I'll see you in a few hours on the Marco Learning YouTube channel. Um, but if not, I'll see you back here on my YouTube channel tomorrow for my big AMA, our last kind of cram session before the test. All right, uh, good luck studying. Thanks for joining me.